Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, Dermot O'Shea is my name, and I'm the current president of the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here uh, in the Corrigan Hall in 6 Kildare Street, kicking off our... Well, in fact, we're not kicking off our annual symposium because it sort of kicked off on Friday with uh, the Faculty Paediatrics meeting, which was a wonderful success. Uh, and we moved from one part of the spectrum to the other part of the spectrum, which is living well, living long. Um, those of you joining us online, uh, you're really welcome. And those of you in the hall, I think you're all in for a treat because we have, uh, for the with the best will in the world, uh, a panel that uh, cons uh, I think has... Is, is very inspirational, really, and it's going to give us a very different look at ageing. So we're really interested in people online and in the room. If you think of questions as we go along, submit the questions, and we'll have a look at them online. And if we have time, we'll get to a few of them, and we may ask for some in the room. So I will introduce in time uh, Rachel Duffy, uh, who is the uh, former Rosa Tralee from uh, 2022, uh, and an age-friendly ambassador for uh, an age-Ireland-friendly ambassador. Um, Roseanne Kenny, who is uh, from Mayo, uh, her father has uh, those prized All Ireland medals with Mayo, uh, two of them, uh, and uh, she is the principal investigator in the Irish Language Study of Ageing, and uh, Mr. Francis Brennan, uh, who would be known to many of you, uh, uh, whether it's as a television star, an etiquette guru, uh, or uh, a, a hotelier. Uh, and I had the privilege of many years ago of working with him or for him. Actually, it's both with him and for him. Um, so what you're going to hear today is really uh, a chat around what makes us tick as we age. But I want to tell you a tiny little bit about the College of Physicians before we start, because uh, we were founded in 1654. Uh, we're the largest postgraduate training body uh, in Ireland with around 4,000 alumni. And we train, educate, and train and educate doctors for the future. Uh, John Stern was our first president. He was 30 years of age uh, when he founded the college, and he died at the age of 45, which was a good innings in uh, 1654. Uh, our most recent president was uh, Mary Horgan, and she was the first female president of this college, and that came on the back of the first uh, female fellow being admitted to this college 100 years ago in 1924, and that forms part of our heritage uh, day, uh, which is happening tomorrow. So in essence, what we're doing is, uh, as a college, we're looking and following through with doctors over the life course of their career for 40 years or more or less, as the case may be. Um, and we're very much about empowering a healthy nation. And we do that through a combination of training, education and advocacy. And we've done a lot of advocacy work over the years on uh, obesity, alcohol, climate health, um, vaping, smoking, uh, and uh, on ageing. And uh, I guess this is part of that. So I'd hope you'd leave this evening with a few tips uh, around uh, hints, tips, and answers. You're not going to find out how to live forever, but you'll certainly figure out how we can live better and live better for longer. And I think, you know, what we do know is we're all living longer. Uh, the life expectancy, when I, when I was born, life expectancy in this country was 69. It's now 84. When I was born, the population of this country was 2.8 million. It's now 5.5 million. Uh, there were 150,000 people over the age of 65 when I graduated from medical school uh, in the late 80s. There's now over a million. What we know for a fact is the better start you get in life, the better outcomes you get in later life. Um, and preserving our physical and our mental function uh, as we age is really important uh, so that the longer lifespans we have are healthier lifespans. And that's really what the aim of tonight is. I think the other thing to remember is how old you feel is also very important. And the age you feel affects your mental abilities, your cognitive abilities, and your self-related health. So how old society makes you feel is also very important. And I think there's some of the themes that we'll pick up on as we work our way through what I hope is a sort of fairly relaxed and easy conversation piece. So in advance, a huge thank you to our three uh, guests. And uh, let's get a bit of the show on the road. So Rachel, I get to start with you. Uh, so 
uh, Rachel is from Westmead, uh, and she was part of a really interesting trio of things that happened to Westmead in 2022. They won the Talton Cup. They held a really successful FLA. And this young lady uh, won the Rosa Tree. Mm. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think that was a massive step outside of anybody's comfort zone. So yeah. can I ask you first, what encouraged you to run for the Rosa Tralee and how did that lead to becoming an age-friendly ambassador? Yeah, well, I suppose the Rosa Tralee is something in Ireland and in our society and our history that's something quite iconic. It's over 60 years going at this point, but it was never something I had ever, you know, seen myself as or intended on doing, but no more than probably most people, COVID had a huge impact on our lives. And for me, COVID was quite isolating. I saw the Rosa Tralee as uh, just a chance to try something new. I was very much pushed into it. I would say I was kind of reluctant getting involved in Westmead, and, but then I was chosen as the Westmead Rose, and I thought that road for me from, tr from Westmead to Tralee would probably end there, that I would go down, represent Westmead, and as you said, you know, 2022 was the first year we really started to see success in a lot of things. So I definitely wasn't expecting to, to be lucky to be chosen as the Rose of Tralee. So I decided to use those few months where I had a little bit of a platform locally to engage with the community, to do the things that I really cared about and to make the most of that time. Because I suppose I, I was in my early 20s, COVID had hit. I felt hard done by in many ways that I didn't get the opportunity to do a lot. So went to the to the Rosa Tralee and Dahi O'Shea called out Westmeath and I didn't really realise it but it was the start of a new chapter of my life and one of the amazing things about the festival aside from everything it stands for is that when I was chosen I was very much told you take this opportunity and you do what you want to do and, and what's important to you and I think coming from a rural community in Westmeath that was what was important to me. I think I could see the downfalls, I could see the upsides, and I could see the beauty in, you know, volunteerism and the people who were keeping my community alive in a time when everybody was really struggling. So I suppose I really dedicated that time as the Rosa Tralee to get involved with things that were close to my heart. And a lot of those things just so happened to be inspired by the older people in my life. And I think, that was just the way I was reared. I was one of those kids who, whether I liked it or not, I was forced down to the community centre to take part in things and to volunteer. And it's that kind of element of social activism has been in my life ever since I was small. And I think it was, it's a huge part of who I am. And I've been inspired by a lot of older people. So I think representing Westmeath was very special. And doing what I could to affect things in Westmeath was important. So by the time my Rosa Tralee year had come to an end, I was happy. I wrapped it up with a little bow and I said, that's that now on to the next chapter of my life. And it was lovely that only a matter of a few months afterwards, Westmeath County Council came back to me and said, look, we really admire everything you've done for our county as the Rosa Tralee. And we think you represent an awful lot of the values that we would like to see in an age-friendly ambassador. So they asked me to take on that role. And so I was absolutely honored to take it on. And, you know, I'm really proud of it. Uh, can I say, I mean, it's a fantastic story. And can I ask you just with, you're a primary school teacher mm -hmm. uh, and you see the value of working in the community, both with the young and with older people. Mm. Do you think cross-generational or intergenerational contact is important? Yeah, to totally. So, well, I'm training to be a primary school teacher at the minute, and I suppose it's, it's bridging that gap of the generations. And maybe over the course of a few years, and I see it if I'm ever in a classroom where there's very young children, children who were born during COVID, those early years, that contact wasn't really there in the sense that maybe when I was a child, I had so much contact with the older community. It was you know, trying to, I suppose, shelter people and everybody was afraid of COVID as well. So that was a huge, I suppose, influence on that. But for me, I think the way to affect people's perceptions of growing old and older people, it's, it's through education, it's through when people are young, it's trying to shift the attitudes towards aging and towards growing older. Because I think you could ask an awful lot of people of my generation, how do they feel about growing old? And it's, they, it it scares them. You know, but I think my life and the way I've been brought up and an awful lot of the huge influences in my life were older people um, who helped rear me. You know, my mum passed away when I was nine, so I very much relied an awful lot on my grandparents. And, you know, 
I don't feel afraid of aging because I look at my mum's life and I think she didn't get to grow old and it's a privilege to grow old and I wish a lot more people of my generation would see that. And can I tell me, in, in all the different things you do, you told me uh, recently that uh, you were working either, I, I think you, you do shifts occasionally in a bar. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. Tell me about an experience, a few experiences you had there. Yeah, so I suppose like any college student would, I had a job at the weekends and it was in a local pub in, in Moat, Egan's, and it's a kind of a traditional Irish bar. You'd have your trad music, you'd have your locals, and this was... Um, I suppose, COVID times. It was pre-Rose of Trillian, and it just so happened to be the pub that sponsored me to go to the Rose of Trillian and everything. So I have very tight links with it, and it's where my family go. And I think during COVID, you know, we had these, you know, the barriers up. You couldn't sit at the counter. And we would often have an awful lot of older people who would come in every day. You'd see a lot of bachelors coming in. And I never really noticed it until I was in that position where... I was the only one behind the bar and people would come in and I found it particularly with older men who would really confide in me and they they could tell me how they got on at the doctors they could tell me how their hospital appointments were going I might have been the first person they spoke to that yeah. day you know and they were craving that connection and I began to feel I have a real responsibility in this job whether I realize it or not that you can have a huge impact on people and I've, I've seen this thing and I've tried to remind myself it, of it. It's, there's so much good in the world and if you can't see it, be it. And it's about if you see someone and you think, you know, I'm going to go and ask how they're doing, how they're keeping, it's so easy to do that, to just change the course of someone's day and to change the course of someone's mindset of, I'm so lonely, to, I have, I have found a friend in that person. Right, and I mean, that's fantastic to hear. We might come back to that and I can mm -hmm. see Roseanne itching to get in, but I'm not going to let her in yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to skip over to Francis Brennan and ask... Well, just to say, oh. what you just said there, it's similar in Kenmare with older people. Like, I talk to them on the street because they might talk to nobody during the day. Okay. And, and then well, they know me. I, I have a famous face, I, almost famous, I say, face, so they will be delighted to talk to you. And I find when I go, like, today coming from Stephen's Green, uh, top of Graff Street to here, I was stopped four times. So I have to wear a cap to get away from being stopped. And then you walked in the front door of the college yeah, and I stopped it 20 off. more times. <laughs> off, yeah. But it's just one of those things. But talking to people is very, very important. And even if it's only a hello and it's at your grand day. But Kenmare is very good for that. Everybody says hello to everybody on the street. I always notice it because when I go to New York, I'm saying hello to fellas I never saw before in my life. Right. And if they could stop it, Francis, they'll think you're doing something that you shouldn't be that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I, just to switch tack a little bit, and we will yeah. come back to that issue of you know, isolation and loneliness a little later on because <clears throat> uh, it's a very important area. But um, bef before we go into your change of career path, I was very taken recently with a particular set of exercises and tests you do. And I wonder, for, th for those people at home, uh, sitting down if they can, and for the huge audience in the room here, yeah. might you demostrate it for us? And we might well, participate with you all if my you life, gave us the instructions. All my life, I always get out of a chair without touching the hands. I don't know why, okay? But if you tell me now, you'll agree, yeah. that it's wonderful for your core. So when you're getting out, and you know, if you're going to buy a new sofa in your 60s, look at the height of it off the ground. Because some of them you'll never get out of it, all right? Even the, <laughs> if your husband is pulling you out, you'll be lucky because the furniture is made much lower at times, okay? So that's number one. And another thing that I do all the time, when I'm driving in my car, I pull my tummy in and out like that, doing those sort of core exercises. Now, it might only do it for three minutes, but okay. it just, it's so simple and it's very easy to do. So, so I, I've, I've always known you as a, a person with style and a person with purpose, but I never knew you as a gym worker. Can I tell you, so, I was never in a gym in my life. Okay. Okay. The stairs in the Park Hotel, up and down, <laughs> 400 times a day, oh, yeah. kept me going. Oh, all right? okay. I never use a lift. When I go to the doctor, I always go up through the, the stairs. I never use a lift. Okay. So, Roseanne, can I come to you on the back of that? Because I know, uh, as the principal investigator of the Irish Longitude Study of Ageing, what Francis has just told us there is a core piece of important information that you've been looking at for decades with people in Tilda. So do you want to give us the science behind what he just yeah. told us? Actually, there is good science to support what you've just said. Yeah. Uh, not so much the tummy bit, although <laughs> building core is very important for gait and balance, yeah. but the standing without using your arms, because that's a good um, yeah. a, a test of core. And it's one of the tests we use in the longitudinal studies worldwide 
to watch how that deteriorates as people progress and get older, etc. So practicing it is, will be good for core, for building muscles. And probably if I was asked, what's the one thing that I should do as I get older to maintain my mobility and my memory? Because they're the two things people want. When you say, you know, what do you want out of getting older? What do you want out of life? There's only two things. And if you think about them, they cover everything. I want to keep my memory right to the bitter end and I want to keep my mobility. And that test will certainly help mobility. Okay. And can I ask, the other thing he said was um, the, that he takes the stairs, not the elevator. Mm. Uh, mm. And I met a man, would you believe, a few weeks ago, 100 years of age, and I asked him, uh, what's his secret? Mm. And he said to me, it's an egg a day, Doc. But in fact, that's probably about protein. Mm. So just from the point of view of take home messages mm. for people here and online, um, is there something that I can do with a combination of some of the exercises and a protein t intake that's so, going to help? So protein me. intake, but we could come back to the stairs for a moment. Okay. Very often, not, not all of us every day have the time to spend an hour in the gym or, or doing rapid walk, whatever, okay? Mm -hmm. But you can actually use your environment to walk very quickly, to take the stairs as often as you possibly can. Never take a lift unless you're carrying heavy objects. Never take a lift. Always take the stairs. Have you a number of floors you won't go above on a lift? It doesn't I... really matter. You can pause. You can take a okay. breath. You know, you, right. It doesn't actually matter. So, so I would say they're pretty good things. Protein matters. As we get older, we need to supplement protein. You can do it through the diet, and there's evidence that you can do it through the diet, but you need to take quite a bit of protein, actually, to compensate for the protein loss. And protein loss uh, results in weaker muscles. In fact, it contributes to a condition called sarcopenia, which is loss of muscle mass and bulk. Mm -hmm. So taking protein, either through supplements, particularly if you are going to the gym and doing um, weights and resistance exercises, etc., or through a good protein intake in the diet, is really more important, actually, as we get older. Mm -hmm. We assume whey protein intake, for example, is something that young, muscly lads do in the gym. Not so. It is actually just as important for all of us as we're getting older to take supplements. Okay. You, I get, Francis, I'm going to come back to you for a minute, and then I'll come back to Rachel with this one as well. But uh, the, I had a letter in some time ago from a lady, and she said to me, you're very lucky you've got purpose on a plate. And she then began mm -hmm. to explain it to me in the letter. And it was very revealing to me at the time. But you recently sold your hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, you, so would you have advice for anyone who's stepping away from their primary career? Or, uh, or how has life changed for you yeah. since you've done well, that? It's a big, I mean, I was there for 42 years. I worked every single day that I was in Kenmare mm. in the hotel. I would go to the hotel quarter past half eight every morning, and I'd leave it at half ten at night. So, like, I was just there all the time. Mm. Now... John and I, my brother who's with me in the hotel, um, we, we always discussed what we were going to do in the future and we always thought that we would sell the hotel someday, all right? As it happened, we had done a big job during COVID on the ground floor of the hotel, completely remodeled at a, gr a huge price, we won't even go there, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was a lovely job. And then we had done bedrooms over the years, so we were in very tip-top condition. And in the hotel business, people that buy hotels, they don't want to go in and have to spend a fortune they like to buy the hotel and leave it as it is. So there was never better, I would agree, in 42 years as it was the day we sold it. So we sold it, okay? Now, I step away. People say to me, oh, God, how did you cope? I never look back. I just kept going in what the TV work and done stores and whatever else I'm doing, okay? And I move along nicely, and I have much more time to myself. I did spend a summer, this summer, three months in Mallorca, because I have a place there. The whole family has used it for 20 years. I never got to it. Yeah. But I got to it this year for three months. Right. And I have a funny story about ageing in Mallorca. This is the first time I ever felt I was old. Okay? So I'm going there for 20, I have the apartment 22 years. So I'm walking down to the beach and I'm walking along and there's all these young fellas, you know, in yellow jackets and all the rest. And they're handing out vouchers for two for one drinks or free entry to the nightclub. And I'm walking along and they don't give me one. <laughs> And that was the first time in my life I thought, oh, I'm past it. Yeah. <laughs> because every other year they offered me a voucher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought it just summed up age in yeah. one simple action, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, um, but uh, no, I just, you know, I was lucky now. At 54 years of age, I did a television program called um, Designs for a Living, 
which was about building a house in Kenmare, which we were talking about earlier. Yeah. It was a very nice house, very nicely built. It was a nightmare build. We were put off the site by the county council and all sorts of carry on. But we eventually got there. And then as a result of that television show, RTE producers saw me on camera and then the At Your Service idea was produced from Belfast by another company. And they said in RT, we'll do that show if you get Francis Brennan. But Francis Brennan didn't want to do that show. I said, no, thank you very much. They came back the next year, and John, my brother, said, well, you go ahead and do it. You're made for it, and you'll enjoy it. And then I did it, and the rest is history. Right. But I was lucky to change, not to change. I never changed my career. I still worked as much as I did in the hotel. But I had another career. I mean, I have a career now in At Your Service. It could go on for another 20 years. Oh. Uh, if, if, if the people like it on the, on the screen. Yeah, no, no, it's a fantastic program, it's yeah. very interesting. Can I ask you, the other thing, you have a tremendous, have always had a tremendous capacity to make people feel valued and to feel um, relevant slash important, and you instill great loyalty uh, in the staff that work with yeah. you. Is that, uh, do you think that's important? I, or do yeah, you think uh, well, for me, it's absolutely everything, all right? I don't know anything about how I do it, not at all. I'm the best interviewer in the world but I could say to you, what have you got in your left-hand pocket in the middle of the interview? And if you don't know, you mightn't get the job because you're not organised. <laughs> Are you with me? I won't, you. I won't embarrass you, Dermot. <laughs> but simple things like, or if they, like, I remember one time uh, we were looking for a, a barman, actually, because Donald was in the bar with us, or Jeremy was in the bar with us over the years, um, and he, was, he came from Yall. And I said to him, now, name three towns that you passed through. He didn't even say Cork. <laughs> like... Uh, but that's, you have to be aware, or, you know, a sort of, I'd be looking for that in youngsters. Another thing in, in instilling, like, starting out in life, I'd always look to see, were you a babysitter? Did you pump petrol at the station? Did you work in a bar at night? Because then you have a work ethic. And, and then I ask about mum and dad, and what did they do? One was a garden, mum was a teacher, and all that. I think, great, stable home, everything. And that sets that young fellow up for a career in the industry. Okay. The, the other, and this is Shane, I'll come back to uh, Rachel after I've asked this last question to Francis. Uh, you talk about the importance of reflective ageing or mindful ageing in one of your books. What do you actually mean by that? To be prepared. Mm. Because people come to 65, 66 years mm. of age and they, they leave their job, they go home. Their whole life was the job. Mm. All their social life was a drink afterwards with the work friends and nobody at home. Okay. And you have to think, like I knew... I had, a, a very, I had a very nice country house, 11 miles from Kenmare, with 12 acres of cutting grass, can you imagine? It was huge. And 63 acres, all right? I didn't have anything on the 63 acres. I didn't have animals, really, but it was there. And a lovely house. But I knew that when I got older, I couldn't live in this house. I have a gate that opens when it decides to open and close, all right? Mm -hmm. I have a well that pumps water when it decides to pump water or not. I have eaves on the house that fall down every winter, although I stick them up every winter. So you need to plan your life that you're not left with loads of worries in your retirement age. So it's the old scouting motto, <coughs> be, be all of, be prepared. Be all of, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Rachel, come back to you, because you live in a, rural t in a rural part of Ireland as well. Um, what have you seen work well community-wise for strengthening social connections in your... Um, well, I suppose I, I could probably just use my own community as an example. Um, Rosemount, you know, very small rural community, no shop, no pub. We have a football pitch and a church and a primary school and a few, I suppose, very active um, individuals in the community, I suppose, came together with that question in mind, what can we do for the people in this community who are getting older, who may not want to go down and play cards, who may not want to play bingo, who are interested in the GAA, might be interested in other goings on. Um, and so in conjunction with our local GAA club, the social initiative was born. And this is a group who every few weeks they go on trips here, there, and everywhere. They do days out. They do different classes and courses. Only last weekend, they went on a boat up the Shannon and went to a pub and went dancing and, and all that. And, you know, they have done various trips around the, the country and they support everything. And if there's something, say, the GAA is doing, the social initiative are involved, or if there's anything happening locally, they also have a, they'll always have a foot in the door, but it's been incredible for 
the life of the community and, and for giving people a reason to, to go to something and, and giving people that sense of friendship and connection. And it's not, you don't have to be over a certain age to mm. go. It draws an awful lot of different people from around the community. So it's not this thing of, oh, you have to be retired to take part. You don't. And just as like a blueprint for lots of communities, it, it works. Okay. And Roseanne, can I ask you, because I'm mm. mindful you had a, with Tilda as well, went around the country to GA clubs. Mm. Uh, so do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, uh, I've got so many things to pick up on. Well, um, first of all, the GAA, they're a wonderful organisation. They have an amazing network and they're fantastic to collaborate with. Mm -hmm. So what we, what, what we wanted to do was take the research that we're doing in Trinity outside of the haloed walls and into the community. And we partnered with the GAA to do that and did a tour of all of the counties of Ireland. But it was a, much like this afternoon's chit chat, it was a, a, an event with a difference. So for example, up in Donegal, we had the 100 People's Choir, which is young people, uh, sorry, people of all ages singing from 10 up to 94 was, was the eldest, as I recall. Then, then the ambassadors for the event were four or five GAA players, male and female, from the county, who uh, told their own story, actually, and it, the story could have been anything just like you say, uh, Rachel, but maybe problems, maybe issues they had, maybe great successes, and etc. Um, and then I did a talk on aging and what it's like to get older, but uh, grounded in science and evidence and based on the TILDA study and other similar studies worldwide. And that was the way we shared the science that we'd been doing in Trinity, but w w it, it translated quite easily like that. Mm. And we... And and the other thing to say is, so we did the counties. Um, we never did it in a haloed or, uh, institution like this. They were all in local hotels that, the, that had a good, strong bond with the GA. So they gave the venue for nothing. And then the GA funded everything else. And we had the two All-Ireland Cups there as well for people to get their okay. photographs taken okay. with, et cetera. They were so successful. And I don't think, as a scientist, I've enjoyed anything as much, actually, in all of my academic life. Okay. And did it continue? That so then COVID hit. Oh, yes. And, and, and we, we can, we've done a whole lot of work since then. And we should pick up on it, and we should pick up on it with an intergenerational theme. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking as, as Rachel is speaking. So we can certainly do that. But there was one thing you said, and then you picked up on it, Francis, which I think is awfully important. Preparedness for retirement, etc., And including in your, in, your, in your environment, your home, and etc. A lot of people so-called downsize, don't like the word, but they do. Um, and very often they do that and move out of their communities. Mm, and, yeah. you know, even the pub you were describing and the, the, the men going in there and drinking, that is so important for their social engagement. Yeah. They will never recreate that, generally speaking, in a new environment. No. No. So it's awfully important when you're changing your environment to reflect on, okay, who is my community? And our community isn't your necessarily your best friends, they matter. Isn't necessarily your family, they matter. It's the local shop. Where, where they know you when you pop in. It's the local park where if you're walking your dog, people stop and you have your chat, etc. It is the pub and all of that. All of that constitutes your important community for you as an individual. So well, you, no, just uh -huh. to pick up on that. When yeah. I was moving house, yeah. most people in this room, if I say, oh no, I couldn't move house, I have so much stuff. That's what they all say. Yeah. Because they're terrified to move, all right? Mm. A friend of mine said, how many needs and everything have I got? I have 11. Get 11 boxes, take that, 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 this vase, that bowl, that, um, yeah. I collect apples as it happens, I had 400 of them, all right? Uh, give them all, so I, I, I Apples the fruit. Yeah, no, uh, as in, there could be, Self. it could be a stew and glass, yeah. or it could be water, it could be anything, oh, yeah. but I had 400 of them, all right, because my niece and nephews over the years always got me an apple at Christmas, all right? So anyway, that was fine. So I, I put 11 boxes around the sitting room, put, this is the, the year before I was moving. I got a pile of tissue paper from a friend of mine up in, uh, in uh, Galway, the treasure chest, and I rolled up lovely uh, wash for glass bowls, vases, everything, silver, candlesticks, all this, and they all got something, yeah. and they all got a painting as well. And do you know something? They were absolutely delighted, yeah. and so was I, because I got rid of all the stuff. Yeah. Okay. So anyone with a lot of niece and on your moving house, that's the thing to do. Yeah. Right. And then my niece this Christmas sent me a lovely photograph, of her, she's married in Sing Street in Dublin now, of her table set up with the two tureens and the veg dish, and oh, I was nice. so happy. <laughs> yeah to see right. it being used properly. Yeah. 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 And actually, this is like just to pick up a little bit on this. Uh, 
and I was listening to something recently where they were talking about health and equities, and one of the things, home ownership, <coughs> home ownership education come up uh, in terms of being possible predictors mm. in your uh, health outcomes. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, when we're talking about home ownership, uh, there are, there's a lot of issues around that as well. So are there yeah. any sort of so, health and equity issues? Was no, I'd like to, to uh, thank you for, uh, so, so a, very, a big driver of ill health uh, as we get older is actually uh, poor socioeconomic circumstances, particularly intergenerationally throughout your y young and adult life. And education is a good marker for that. People with ter third level education actually age, live longer, and they have a much healthier experience as they get older. They don't get the same degree of diseases, the same burden of diseases. Um, so ownership is, is a good marker f for that as well. At the moment, it's interesting in Tilda, the, the cohort we started with, it's a longitudinal study, which means we visit the same people, nearly 9,000 people every two years. We've refreshed the sample because it started aged 50. We're 13 years into it, so our youngest person in the study was 63, 64. So then we went back and got another group of two and a half pe thousand people aged 50 to 64 to re refresh the sample. The number of people, the proportion of people in rented accommodation in the new cohort is almost 40%. And in the current cohort, it's only four. Now, I would put to you that at that age, they will not own property ever. And property is one of the strongest predictors for ill health as people get older. Mm -hmm. But it's also a huge financial worry and stress and burden be because what's going to happen to me? I don't own where I'm sleeping. And as I get older, where, where am I? Where is my future? It's a huge stress. I saw that in America mm. some years back. When a nan of mine, she was 84, living in an apartment in Stuyvesant Town, which is a big block of apartment blocks, right? And she was on a fixed rent. Mm. Okay? And then some guru bought the place and he mm. wanted to put the rent up. Mm. But she was working off her social security and not a lot left when she paid for the rent, okay? Mm. And if this fella came in and did what he was going to do, anyway, they brought in a law not to let it happen. But a lot of the, p I, 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 I worry about people all the time. I'm in America and I'm, look, I'm in a coffee shop and there's a woman behind the counter and she's 90. And I'm thinking, mm. oh my God, if my mother was there, I just wouldn't be able for it. But that woman behind the counter has to work mm. because her social security barely covers her rent because she never mm. bought a house and she has to eat. Mm. It's mm. a frightening thing. Exactly the outcome you're talking about. Now, so I mean, and we'll come, I'm going to come back in a little while to ask about a couple of positive tips for aging well, because we're living well, living long. But the other marker for ill health that I heard about recently, and Rachel, we were talking about this, I was loneliness. Mm. Uh, and, um, you know, had you, you had insight from that, from the work that you were doing in your own community. So what are, are age-friendly Ireland? Maybe, Roseanne, this is something you pick up on as well. Uh, what are you doing or what are you doing locally in the communities around that? Or Yeah, well, I just want to touch on as well, like the, the issues you were saying there, which I also feel can are, are across the board in a sense of uniting the generations, mm -hmm. which might be, you know, the housing crisis, mm -hmm. which is, you know, health, loneliness, um, the cost of living. You know, those are serious issues facing younger generations as well, which we fail to realise is, mm -hmm. is present across the board. And, mm -hmm. and as a collective, we should all be trying to tackle those together. Um, but just on, on what you asked, Dermot, um, age-friendly Ireland are just, they're incredible. They're, all of the issues I suppose you, you guys have brought up, whether it's health, whether it's been exercise. Um, I just know in Westmead, like in my own community, there are clubs and societies popping up around the country or around the county with the support of Age Friendly Ireland, with funding from local authority. And they could be a bowls club, it could be a social initiative. And they provide transport to them, so it's yes. not as if you have to have yeah. your own transport. And, and what's great is that there'll be an annual meeting every year and people can raise these issues. People can raise the issues of not being able to make their pension stretch far enough to get work in the house done, you know, or, or not being able to if a local link bus is not passing their door anymore. And they can raise those issues to Age Friendly Ireland about trying to do something about that, along with the local council. Um, but it, it's happening in every council. And I suppose one thing I noticed earlier this year at our 
annual convention was there were, I suppose, you're always going to have complaints, but there was an awful lot of positives coming out of that of people saying there, there, were, there were so great, like, there was such gratitude towards Age Friendly Ireland, towards the local authority for making these changes, because these were things happening in unis that weren't there 15 years ago even. Um, but they are popping up, and it's just about giving those people someone to go to, to yeah. have those conversations. Yeah, and I think, you know, here in the college, and this is one of the reasons we're so keen to have an ageing discussion here on Living Well and Living Long, you know, we've had a lot of advocacy around uh, smoking and vaping, as I said, a lot around alcohol and uh, minimum pricing, a lot around uh, climate health and climate <coughs> change. So the, the, the ageing focus is another very important focus for us. And I guess, Roseanne, to pick up on that loneliness team, mm. you have a lot of data from that, Matilda. Oh, yeah. So um, I'm sorry to be negative. I mean, loneliness and social isolation is really, really toxic, biologically. And people say, well, how can that be? How can a feeling actually affect you physically? But it does because it triggers the, an inflammatory process in, in the system. And we've looked at that in Tilda. And I know that individuals within the study who experience social isolation and loneliness um, actually have abnormal inflammatory markers, significantly abnormal inflammatory markers. And what that does is it, it accelerates aging in, in all of our cells. It is the process of aging. And all the process of aging is about is a disp an imbalance in a cell which makes it much more likely you're going to get an illness or a disease. So if you can kind of keep a cell relatively young or decelerate, slow down the aging process at a cellular level, then you, one is much less likely to experience illnesses and diseases. Since COVID, um, after, immediately after COVID, as I said, we do repeated uh, uh, studies on the same people every two years. So we had done an assessment of loneliness and social isolation and everything else just before COVID. And after COVID and during COVID, we did data sweeps. And loneliness and social isolation for people over 50 in Ireland, I don't like the term old people or older people. I don't use it. You know, it's, it's, it's irrelevant. Just people as they age, okay. as people as they get older. But if you say old and older, you're almost categorizing people negatively because mm -hmm. it has negative connotations. But we found that loneliness and social isolation increased threefold. But that's huge, right? So that's fine. COVID ends. We did another data sweep. Unfortunately, the prevalence of loneliness and social isolation had not gone back to baseline levels. Far from it. It was still twofold higher than it had been pre-COVID. Yeah. So it's lingering. And so this is a new, if you like, long COVID that we're experiencing. We're seeing it in all age groups. I was going to say, is it only in uh, no. older people? No. no. Obviously, our study is, fi is 50 and above. So adults are 50 and above. But we are seeing it throughout the spectrum. There are lots of studies. Um, of younger cohorts who, and we're not sure why it's occurred, but, but, but there was social isolation and loneliness, et cetera, at sometimes very vulnerable periods in younger persons' lives, as well as older persons. So, I mean, this is a transgenerational okay. issue. And Francis, can I ask you, because I've heard you talk about going out for a walk. So if there was a pill for loneliness, mm. uh, we'd be looking to prescribe it mm. because, you know, I, I don't know if there was the right word, endemic, but certainly there's a lot of it around. Yes. Okay. And, then, and then youth as well, you're right. Yeah. The younger yeah, people in the city of Dublin tonight, yeah. there are lonely yeah. single people in apartments yeah. eating a tin of beans. But, yeah. but in terms of taking control of things, Francis, I've heard you describe going out for a walk oh, yourself, yeah. Yeah. out and about, and it is anything but mindful. Yeah. what I've heard you describe. No, but but what are you doing? But I made myself do that. Yeah, so During, we were closed completely in the hotel for three months. And we're not allowed out five miles from our five kilometres. From two, our kilo two kilometres. From yeah, the was it? Yeah. It's okay, they won't. I know, it was, anyway, <laughs> five in Kenmare. Excuse me. Five in Kenmare. I was never caught. I was never caught. <laughs> well, I could, I'd starve then. There's no shop. To, at that stage of my life, there was no shop. The nearest shop is Kenmare, which is yeah. 11 miles. Right? Anyway, then we got But what I used to do every, every even at four o'clock, it was, it was frosty weather, it was March, I put on the jacket and I'd go out the road, all right? And I watched for three months the daffodils come up, the blackberries becoming green. Um, um, buttercups coming, uh, the trees blossoming, and every day I talked to myself and said, oh, isn't that gorgeous? Out of the ditch. Okay. <laughs> and I, and I, every day I absolutely enjoyed it because I could see life coming. And then there was rabbits, young rabbits born because it was spring, and then there was lambs. And like, I just, I, I never paid attention. And I found then later in the year, 
wild strawberries, which I'd stopped the car for recently to see where they, they were okay. still there. I had a few of them. So it's what you call, it's just, it was a very simple way to keep me occupied. But that was a choice. It's probably a little too easy to say attitude's a choice, but certainly you took an approach to yeah. it in terms of... But uh, also you've given yourself a purpose every day. Yeah, that's and right. And purpose is awfully important. Again, biologically, we need purpose. And if we feel we no longer have purpose, we involute because mm -hmm. we're, we're here because we have a purpose and we believe we have a purpose. And once you stop having purpose, actually people involute. So it's, it's both attitudinal and requiring purpose. Okay. And another thing I always think, and I'm not talking religion now at all, but the 10 o'clock mass yeah. in a small Irish town is yeah. great to get people out of bed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because on a winter's morning, you really don't want to get up, but I go to mass every morning at 10 o'clock and, and I meet Mary and we might have a cup of coffee or whatever. That I always think that is a very important yeah. timeline in, the, okay, well, in, the, in a country town. But yeah. actually, Francis, you say that it's really interesting because there's a, a programme around the country that sort of wax and wanes called Get Up, Get Dressed, Get Moving. Mm. Oh, yes. Uh, and just exactly what you said there, uh, get up, get out, and well, get moving. Purpose. It's really important. It's, it's and it's purpose. Now, there's a question in here, and actually we were thinking of touching on the topic, but seeing as it's come in online, and it's sort of around ageism. Uh, and, and I guess, maybe Rosanna, I'll give you first stab at this. How we perceive ourselves influences the pace at how we age, uh, but how society portrays and perceives old age and people's attitudes uh, also affects everyone's experience of aging. So I think whatever ism you want to talk about, ageism, sexism, racism, uh, ageism is probably one of the ones that we mm. haven't really... No. We started have not, no, knocked it. we so haven't. And it's, there's clearly a lack of understanding of ageism and the language around it. I, I, I mean, you know, I mean, take our media for example. Every single day, I can point out to you at, eight, at least one, if not many, ageist comments in the media. And the question to ask yourself, if you wonder, is it or what? Or not, would I say the same about gender? Would I say the same about race? And if you wouldn't, then you should not say the same or make the same comment about aging. It's one of the UN, part of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. It's actually not legal to make ageist comments. And yet it's, I, I think we're pretty good in our media with sexism and uh, racism, but we, it, I can give you so many examples of ageism um, and, and, and repeatedly so in the, in the media. Now, the science behind that very briefly. So we've looked at this in the TILDA study. So we've questions about how you perceive yourself aging, right? And people whose perceptions, are, uh, Francis volunteered, I didn't ask him what age he was, but he said earlier on, I'm 49. Yeah. And, and I said, good for you, because that's what he feels. And actually, there's a science behind that. Feeling 49 slows your pace of aging. I'm not saying you're not 49. Well, 39 now. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so, so there's a science behind that. So perceptions matter. And they actually probably act through the same pathways as stress and loneliness we were talking about before, through inflammatory pathways. So that's the first thing. Perceptions matter. Percep if you have a positive perception, we s slow physical and cognitive aging. But one of the things which undermines your positivity, and it's, you require to be very resilient to circumvent this, is ageist language. So if you're constantly, as you get older, if you feel positive, you feel very you know, upbeat about things, but if you're constantly bombarded by ageist language and ageist attitudes, we have shown that that affects, eventually, your perceptions of how you're aging. It gets in under the skin, under the hood, and that has a negative consequences. And Rachel, because I know that's something you feel very strongly about as well. Yeah. Um, do you want to make, add anything to that? Yeah, and I was, that was my first thought as well when you said that about the media. It's, and that media that we consume, it does become a reflection of how we see ourselves and we see the world around us. Um, but I, even just from, you know, I'm 25 and I find women's ageing in particular mm. at, at my age is huge taboo. Mm. It's like, never ask a woman what age she is. Mm. That in itself is is so ridiculous. Mm. Um, but then technology, I think, for my generation, has a huge role to play. You turn on Instagram, you turn on TikTok, and it's every single thing you swipe to mm. is a miracle cure mm. of keeping mm. you young forever and mm. preventing lines, preventing this, preventing mm. that. It's cosmetic procedures to stop your body in its 
its natural progression, which is mm -hmm. at its core so strange and wrong. But we have accepted that as normal. Pamela Stevenson recently, you know, Baywatch, for those of you of my generation. <laughs> yeah. And, and she recently came out and, and uh, wearing no makeup, yeah. right? Her hair tied back, wearing no makeup and declared she wasn't going to wear makeup or do anything um, uh, false, if you like, like that going forward. Mm -hmm. And she looked beautiful in her natural skin. She was lambasted in social yeah. media, yeah. but a number of her friends and colleagues, I mean, significant proportions of people in Hollywood, et cetera, came out in support of her and said, we should be doing more of this. So it takes, you have to be brave. Yeah. You have to be brave because you will be, there will be a negative intonations for a period of time afterwards. Yeah, and particularly on that, like Pamela, um, when she was young, she would have probably been uh, like the poster so girl Stevenson for or Anderson? Anderson. 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 Um, there you go. She would have been the poster girl for cosmetic surgery, really. Yeah. And even yeah. at that period, she was shunned. Yeah. And she was, you know, just criticised. Yeah. And, you know, so it's really you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't yeah. in yeah. that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's, I suppose, going down a different road. Um, but it's definitely, it's our attitudes towards ageing. And it's, it's a financial, you know, it's, it's an industry. It's yeah. somebody is making millions and billions mm. off of, I suppose, particularly women's fear of aging. Yeah, I think as I hear the, as mm. I hear the discussion going on, I think your point about women's aging and aging in general is very well made. But you mentioned we've managed to get this far into this conversation and never once talked about technology. Mm. Uh, I just wonder in terms, and I, I know the challenges I have, uh, you know, I, I changed my phone recently. I specifically didn't change it for ages because... <laughs> really? going to be, I just didn't want to get, go there. Yeah. Um, do you think there are opportunities in cross-generational, uh, I'm probably putting too much of a fancy term on it, but cross-generational engagement in, in support of technology? Yeah, I think technology should be for everyone. I think this idea that it's so, like, technology is solely used by kids and teenagers and it's not true, you know, I didn't learn how to use a phone overnight. You know, if I can learn how to use a phone or use a laptop or a computer, anyone can. And even I would say I'm not that great at it either. Um, but it's definitely one of those things that I feel while we have all moved so far in the last maybe 20 years and, and everyone's been brought along, technology is that one area where a lot of generations have just been left behind mm -hmm. and they've not been brought in on that conversation. Okay. Francis, well, you no, look, you look the, eager to get in. On the technology, <laughs> no, 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 on the technology, not great on technology, but I manage. Um, but there are, you know, the TUI school courses, they do a, a, a portion of the year mm. where they take, you know, they go to mm. a, a club or something and they yeah. teach people. Are they go, I actually think they go to the homes. Sometimes of, they, of, they do might go out to a nursing they, home as well. They help train and that, do you know what's brilliant about that? That's bringing the older generation and the younger mm. generation together, and they both have something to give and learn. Yeah. And I think that's a fantastic thing they should like, really roll out more. But I've heard of co the college, TY, that, you know. Yeah. Um, um, Roseanne, when, when the, the college were uh, preparing me to interview you and Francis, they, uh, Siobhan and Audrey gave me a copy of your book, Age Proof. So Siobhan's now sitting down there worried about what question I'm going to ask out of it. Uh, but uh, there, were, there were two things that came across on it. One was something about swimming in cold water, mm -hmm. and the other was about uh, a group of Italians who moved over to, from Rostio in um, mm. Italy, and they moved to some part of the States. Mm. And there was a lot of uh, sociological data got out of that that looked at health. So do, you, do you want to pick either of those? Because well, I didn't read it closely uh, sure. enough. Sure, OK. So, um, Cold water is great, <laughs> and cold water swimming, if you can do it, is even greater because it's in the uh, it's in the fresh air. I was on holidays last week in beautiful Mayo, and swam every day. Divine, cold but divine. The water is warm in Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Francis. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. We've no toilets. Um, so, what what um, I would like to say about Rosetta is what Rosetta did. Was, uh, so there's Rosetta in Italy, and then the, the, the emigration in the late 1800s to a place in Pennsylvania, and they developed another village like the Italian village called Rosetta in Pennsylvania. And bottom line was they were living longer than other places in the States, and they weren't getting the same level of diseases for, the, for their age group or disorders as others in the States anyway. Long story short, it was identified that the secret that for this good physical health in Rosetta was actually Rosetta itself. They had a fabulous 
community. So you talked about church. Every Sunday, they would meet after the church. And the researcher, Stephen Wolfe, who started to look at this, first of all, couldn't work out. It wasn't their diet. It wasn't exercise. It wasn't smoking. It, was none of the th it wasn't genes. It was none of the things we traditionally associate with longer living. And he was sitting outside in the square, and all the houses built up around the square um, in Rosetta in the States, and he saw them pile out of the church, but it didn't stop there. They stayed. They stayed for an hour, for two hours, chatting, engaging. And then they started taking tables out of the houses, and they had almost like a communal lunch, where, which everybody right, shared right. intergenerationally. Yeah. And three or four generations were living in one household at the time. And it was then that the penny dropped. The secret of Rosetta was Rosetta itself. Yeah. Yeah, and that was the first time in, in kind of the science world that we had a robust observation linking all of the things we've been talking about, social engagement, communities, not having loneliness, etc., having a value, the population at the time of 2000 with 22 civic communities. So having something to do, having a purpose, and associate that with health. Okay. Now, actually, and I'm this is a really interesting question that's come in from online, and it's very interesting it's come in online, and it's touched on something that was in the back of my head, but I just forgot to ask. So there are people who can't leave their house yeah. for a variety of yeah. reasons, number one. Uh, and number two, there are people on lots of different medications mm. for usually pain problems that, that's mm. keeping them at home. Uh, so I suppose, Rachel, I've got to come to you first before I come to the medication piece to Roseanne, but to you and to Francis people who can't get out of their house. Mm. What are you doing locally in communities for them in Westmead? Yeah, I suppose it's, it's kind of a local authority issue, but it's also an issue probably for the HSE as well in the sense that a lot of these people who might be released from hospital for an illness or a fall, you know, some of them aren't directly going straight home. They may be going to a nursing home for a number of weeks and then home. When it's there then that that extra care is needed, I know there's, there is problems with, for example, home help and issues around that. I've seen it with my own grandparents of trying to get consistent home help there. Um, and that's just as my, in my own personal life as a civilian trying to organize that. Um, but I think it's, it's something that each community have to organize themselves in the sense that recognizing who in your community is not getting that immediate okay. you know, attention. Um, in our community, we're very lucky that we have that sense of people visiting and, and I suppose it's people rambling in a way. And you often have a few people who will ramble to houses and, and check in on people. Again, you'd rely maybe on the local priest who might go out for communion and those types of things. Um, but it's, I suppose it's one of those things that's different in every... Yeah. And Francis, I know in Kenmare, because I know during COVID in Kenmare, the community yeah. spirit in Kenmare was extraordinary. Yeah, we have a very good community spirit in Kenmare. Yeah. We do meals on wheels. Because the hotels, you know, they, once every two weeks, it's your turn to do oh, right. these So it works very well. And it gets the hotel staff involved because yeah. they go delivering. I always think that's a good idea. Yeah. But um, I, I mean, I know loneliness is a big problem for people. Yeah. And it is very difficult if you're five miles outside Kenmare, up the mountain, okay? Yeah. And it's from, my mother used to always say from January to, to March was always the hardest time. She lived in the country, country uh, as well, because it would be dark at four o'clock and it wouldn't mm. get bright until seven o'clock. And you know, if you're on your own completely and you're watching television, well, first of all, you go dilly dally watching television, even though it's part of my life. But you do, you know, watching television all the time is just chronically desperate. Yeah. So it is a problem, and we have a lot of, I suppose, in most the same. There would be single farmers mm -hmm. all around. You know, I see them coming and going. They, I know there's much better facility now for them because I see what I call the tinfoil dinner in the central supermarket where they can buy a proper dinner. Yeah. You know, produced by somebody locally and not frozen or anything like fresh dinner. Annette, is, I can't remember the girl's name, but she tells me she sells 80 of them every day. Right, okay. So, so there, are, there are, but I know, I know the community services down there are very good and very strong. And Roseanne, to come back to that other point, that question of medications and tablets, which is not really, that's a completely different issue, I guess, mm. than what we've been talking about. But um, do you think, by and large, we're, I mean, clearly people need medication for conditions, full stop, but do you think we're over-prescribing or so do you think we're cutting there's, back? I know that there's a perception that once you start on a drug, you're on it for the rest of your life, including blood pressure lowering drugs. Mm -hmm. And actually we know now that your physiology is constantly changing. Medication requires to be constantly reviewed. 
Um, and I think it's important for people to be aware of that and to maybe speak to their general practitioners about, look, can you have a look at my drugs and see, do I need all of these drugs? As, as, as we age, being on lots of medications actually presents its own risks in terms of falls and stability and that. So, so it's, it's worth reviewing medications and de-prescribing, de etc. But, you know, with respect to the, what we were talking about with the communities, if I could make one comment, you know, back not so long ago, there was the local pubs, and that environment has changed hugely since the, the laws have changed. There was the local post office, which was a hub for engaging. And there was the mart, where the gentleman you're speaking of, who yeah. were, it was a great opportunity for them to spend hours in the company of others who share common interests, etc. Gone. Okay. So I particularly feel strongly about the post offices because I think they were eradicated without a vision towards the bigger picture in terms of communities. And what they served. And what they served. It was just done from financial reasons. And if we could actually, if we could actually reflect on what it is that makes a community a vibrant community and invest at government level, and as you say, we have elections coming up, what, what will the investments do? be to ensure we all are part of communities, and that includes cities. Loneliness is no more prevalent in rural Ireland than it is in our urban environments. It's the yeah. same. Now, I know there's, there might be a couple of questions from the floor, so if people are thinking, because we're coming up to near half six, so there may be one or two questions people want to ask, but I am going to come back and ask about uh, maybe a couple of positive tips for ageing from each of you before we bring it to a close. Uh, so in case the, we've had a good number of questions in online that we've sort of peppered in through the uh, meeting, but it's just if anybody in the room wants to ask one. Um, and I lost my thread. I was going to ask you something else. Um, the, in terms of for, for trying to get the living well, oh yeah, I know what it was, women and men, there's always a difference in age expectancy between mm. the two. So women always outlive men mm. on life expectancy. Is the fact that things you've just described there about, um, you know, ability to be, you know, the mart gone, the uh, many years ago, the Queen's Post Office, etc., not there, you know, are women better to stay socially connected? Are yes. they better to have connection and friends? Is there evidence for that yeah, than is. men? Yeah. And oh. is that a big part of it? Mm -hmm. I mean, the bottom line is, yes, there are. But the, the gap is actually narrowing now. And one of the hypotheses is the, 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 it's narrowing because of... Um, Women are also very stressed, lads. <laughs> they also experience stress. And, and, and you know, the, the, the previous model was that men were the bread earners. They were under a lot of pressure and stress, etc. And they had behavioral issues with alcohol and smoking, which, which shortened uh, lifespan. And women weren't under those same pressures. But the way our world has changed, the, those factors are also changed. So there's a number of elements, and, and it, is, it is changing. It is narrowing, yeah. Okay, well, it's been, it's been a fascinating discussion. It's like the men's shed now, as an example. Yeah, they're brilliant. Yeah. They're brilliant for, for yeah. small towns like yeah. that. Absolutely. And to keep people involved, even if they're only yeah. hammering a nail in a barrel. Do you know what I mean? It's, this, it's the fact that you're with others and you're yes. talking. Yes. Whether you can do anything or not. Even if it's the buttercups you're exactly. talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't answer. Um, is there anybody on the, on the floor? I mean, we've, th there's no more questions coming in online, and I'm going to come back to the panel for uh, maybe two tips each on that. Uh, to help with aging. Yes, Jen. You might just, if you don't mind saying your name, and uh, just. Nick. Uh, I, I'm, I'm more than 50. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to see if any of you had any thoughts about the sandwich generation. Hmm. The, the, the group of us who have elderly parents who need input and still have uh, the next generation who need input. And with the demographics changing, uh, there are probably more people in that situation. How can we cope with that? Yeah, this is a really good point, and thank you for raising it, because I don't think we put enough of emphasis on caring. And, and the sandwich generation are uh, an example of extreme caring, because they're caring at both ends of the spectrum. Sandwich generation is you're caring for younger cohorts, and you're caring for older cohorts. Generally speaking, there isn't as much pressure in caring for younger cohorts. And, and that's also interestingly socioeconomically driven. So um, 
the, the, those who don't have to, which some of the lower socioeconomic groups do, they have to look after grandchildren because there is no other financial alternative. Those who aren't in that situation um, actually get more pleasure from grandparenting, I'm speaking of now, and, 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 and there isn't the same stress associated with it. Conversely, if we're caring for an older generation, then that generally does put pressure on people. Now, if you, so you're the informal carer, you're not getting paid for it, but if you are actually, if that is complemented by adequate formal care, then it can be a very pleasurable experience. It's when you become under pressure and stress and there seems to be no outlet, no get out clause, then it puts people under a lot of pressure. Well, it's, it's been um, a fascinating hour of a conversation, and I'm going to wrap it up nearly. I'm going to wrap it up nearly by asking you to uh, give us two points each for a positive aging world, and if you want to throw in something that you feel the college could do to help uh, promote that. So, um, Francis, do you want to? two positive things to age well or age... So I'll, say, I'll tell you a joke first. Because <laughs> it, it describes old age brilliant, all right? Just um, Ken, a, a young boy who worked with me like you when he was a young fellow in college, all right, was in Galway one day and he was on the side of the road and he was crossing, you know, his zebra cross, or a, a light crossing, and he hit the button, you see, and being a hotelier he is to this day, there was two Americans standing here beside him, you see. So he hit the thing and the, the waited, and then the thing went beep, 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 beep. So he goes across, see, and when he's halfway across, he looks back, and the two Americans are like this. Mm. See, so he thinks, oh, I'll go back and help them, because that's the way we are in the hotel business. So he goes back and he says, is there something wrong? Your man says, what's the noise? Mm. Oh, he says, that's, uh, Ken says, that's for the blind people. And her husband turns to her, 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 his wife and said, do they let blind people drive in Ireland? <laughs> 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 so... So I think we're all doing much better than that. All right. <laughs> so that that's good. That's good enough. That's yeah, your that's, due. I think that's, I think that's, that's good. That's good. I wouldn't top that. All right. Rachel, yourself? Um, I suppose, firstly, probably, as you said, about your walk-in and, and finding ways of, of finding a community. It's about being an active participant in finding that connection. You know, it's loneliness. It's very easy to succumb to loneliness, loneliness but you have to be an active participant in wanting to be a part of a community as well. The help is there and it's, it's about asking for it, which is a very Irish thing as well, to not want to bother anyone, but just to know that you're not a burden on anyone. And then I suppose another point would probably be more for my own generation is to, I suppose, approach the older people that are in your life with more empathy and more understanding that you have an awful lot more in common than you realise, that you can learn an awful lot from those people in your lives and you know, it's, it's import, important to foster those relationships and to be active in stories and, and our history and our culture. We have so much to learn from people who are in our lives who have lived in different generations. So I think that's important for my own generation to remember as well. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. And then Roseanne? Okay, so two positive messages, and I'm not going to dictate to people what to do. First thing is evidence-based that after 50 in Ireland, life gets better. Oh. And it continues to get better, Francis, <laughs> until 78, 79. And the only thing which drives a reduction in that is ill health. So the longer you can do the things that we know work to keep well, mobility and memory, your quality of life is better. And in Ireland, we're living longer than any other country in Europe at the moment. Oh, so good. embrace it. Well, fantastic. That's a good note. Okay. Well, well I, I mean, to be honest, listening to the three of you, and I, I got, it's impossible to sum this up, and there isn't a lot of summing up to do. I think you've been full of wisdom. I think the three of you as advocates are incredibly generous, incredibly determined, and very inspiring. So a sincere thank you from everybody online and from here in the college for the contribution you've made this evening. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, it is impossible to sum this up, but I guess having listened to uh, what's been said this evening, um, it, purpose is central. Is, is purpose is central to uh, staying in the game, for the want of a better word. And uh, attitude is a choice. I mean, picking up on something you said, Rachel, there, you know, it is hard if things are difficult in your locality, but you've got to try and engage. It's very difficult if you're housebound, and communities have to find a way of joining that. Um, and the other thing I think that came across to me is the power of positive thinking. 
uh, along with education and understanding that you know a good start in life is a help to later years. My mother was an English teacher, uh, and uh, she uh, the first real book I remember reading, and I don't quite know why this popped into my head, was Treasure Island, mm. uh, and it was by Robert Louis Stevenson. And uh, Treasure Island has a character in it called Long John Silver, uh, and Long John Silver is based on a poet. Uh, and it's a poet who was a friend of, um, long, of Robert Louis Stevenson who wrote the book, and the poet was William Henley. Uh, and uh, I think I said, my mother was an English teacher. She'd, send, she'd get me reading books. She would occasionally send us little poetry quotes uh, to uh, remind us uh, and ask us what we thought about them, and I wasn't particularly good at English. But she sent me a quote uh, that was from a poem written by William Henley, which I would say everyone in this room and online knows. And the poem is Invictus. And the quote is, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. Mm -hmm. I am the captain of my soul. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember the first time I read that uh, from my mother, and it really didn't mean an awful lot to me. And she would quiz me about it. And over the years, I've understood that. And listening to this discussion here, this evening, that quote popped back into my head. And I guess, um, and actually Nelson Mandela used that poem, he read that poem in Robben Island, and it was one of the things he actually uh, credited with uh, keeping him going. I'm sure lots of other things were going for 27 years in Robben Island. But um, he also said, Francis, you might like this one, uh, I am now retiring from retirement. So having done all he did at some point, he finally said, actually, I'd like to spend more time with my family. So I would like to thank the three speakers. I'd like to thank everybody in the college who helped put this meeting on. And as sort of an add-on to the Faculty of Paediatrics Day that started our Luke's Week running, um, yeah, Siobhan and our CEO, Audrey, and the team of Gemma and Emma and uh, Gabriella and Roisin have put a lot of work into today. And I think if I was to give uh, three things or ask you, I'm a great believer in the ripple-out effect of meetings. We've loads of people online, we've plenty of people in the room. I'd ask you to consider doing three things as a result of listening to this meeting. One, I'd ask you to do something new for yourself in the next week or two, either a walk, a hobby, a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, or sit down and look out the back window or the front window. So do something for yourself. <clears throat> the second thing I'd ask you to do is do <coughs> something for a neighbour or a friend in the next four weeks. So somebody who you haven't written to, haven't spoken to, haven't phoned, or haven't met, and have been putting it off, do that. And the third thing I'd ask you to do, and Roseanne sort of hinted at this is, and the college here has done this in the last few weeks through, or not in the last years we've had a manifesto, but because the election is upcoming, uh, you're gonna have politicians <coughs> knocking on your door. So I would ask you to ask them what they are doing for child health and what they're doing for our aging population. And I think if we did each of those, and I can see Siobhan down there saying, but they should also ask about climate change and climate health. So, but I'd go for child health and for, for ageing. And I think if we did each of those and challenged our politicians to do a little better for us, I think the ripple out effect of a meeting like this would actually make a major contribution to the potential for change rather than just uh, sitting in a room or sitting at home and listening. So sincere thanks to everybody for their engagement. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a nice cup of tea somewhere. Thank you. Very good.